hear me okay, so take note. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for uh, coming uh, out here today. Uh, my name is Sean Haber. This is Ethan Kaplan. We both work at Warner Brothers Records. Uh, Ethan runs a tech department out there, and uh, I've been working there for about a couple of years. And today we're going to talk about asynchronous data processing, 100 websites and lots of sets. And the 100 websites is somewhat an exaggeration, as you'll see in the next slide here. We really only have 87 sites right now. So, uh, you know, if we do this again in a couple months, it might be 100. Okay. Um, so, uh, just a quick overview of where we're coming from, and then I'll kind of dive into the uh, depths of the talk. We have essentially one Drupal environment. And by that, I mean we just have one multi-site set up with 87 Drupal sites. Now, that, that is a Drupal 5 environment. We actually do have a couple sites running Drupal 4.7. We have a site running Drupal 6. But you know, I didn't feel like cluttering up the slide by explaining that, so one Drupal environment. Uh, as I mentioned, it's multi-site. It's 87 different sites. And that's 87 different databases. Multi-site in our world means that the sites are sharing the same core code base and in many cases the same modules, but they're not sharing databases at all. And I bring that up because that's a point that seems to get lost in a lot of people. Now, I talked to a lot of people over the last year about, about this, and every single time, or almost every single time, people go, oh, so how do you do the database sharing? It's like, we don't. Each site has its own silo of data. And, um, and there's actually been a very, you know, this is somewhat off topic, but that's been a very, very beneficial move in our part to not deal with shared databases. It makes it easy to move it one site to a different database server if needed because we don't have any dependencies on their uh, databases. And, um, and also from the marketing user point of view, if the user signs up at one site, we want them to be able to have a completely different identity on a second site. So, they were a closet case, Ashley Tizzle fan, and, uh, and a Mastodon fan, you know, they would have two separate accounts on those two sites even though they're the same person. Um, with these 87 databases, there's lots and lots of data. And by that, I mean there's lots of information that would be very valuable to a marketing director or a, a financial director, or basically anybody in any company who could use that data to figure out how to market their product towards the proper demographic. So an example would be what's the total number of users on the site? How many users are in role A, role B, role C? What's the gender breakdown? What's the age group breakdown? What's the location breakdown? So the common request by any anybody in any company, I need to view this data. Now, when you have data spread across 87 different sites, that creates 87 different places to potentially look for this, and, and that's kind of really cumbersome. I mean, it's cumbersome enough if we're just three different sites. So how do we build a solution to view all this data in a consolidated way and to access it so we don't you know, take down the database or write in all these queries Essentially, it's one site to rule them all. We build one quote unquote master website that is able to go ahead and aggregate data from all the other sites and display it in a way that's readable and understandable for the user who needs to access that data. There's uh, actually a sign up board over on the There are two ways to do this pull model and a push model. And essentially, a pull model, in a pull model, a master site would act as a, uh, a client and request data from all the other sites, each of the sites in a way acts as a server. In a push model, it's reverse. The master site would act as a server. Each of the, each of the other sites would send data to that server, and the server basically waits on requests. Now, we're breaking this talk down into pull model, push model. I'm here to talk about our implementation of the pull model. Ethan is going to talk about the push model after I'm done. Luckily, the work have So, pull model. How, how did we begin implementing this? 
Well, yeah. on our master site, I basically created a hierarchy of dependencies. And I'm going to go through each one of these in detail. But as you can see here, this is a dependency stack. At the bottom is a site node. Top of that is a query API. Top of that is data aggregation. And lastly, data output. And I'll go ahead and explain each of these in, in detail, but not for too long. Then I'll go ahead and do a live demo and actually pull real-time data from all 87 of our sites, and that'll be pretty exciting. So definitely stick around for that. How's everybody doing so far, by the way? Good? OK. So let's, let's get into it. Site node. Essentially, a site node is a, is a new content type. All I did was write a module that defines a new content type, and you put in fields such as URL, database connection info for that site, so mainly the host name, the username, and password, and the database name, and some additional information. Perhaps you know it might be useful to know document root on the uh, on the server. You know, if you need to kind of do stuff on the file system. But all the site node does is really provide the database information, the URL for the master site. So anytime you, you create a new site, you go ahead and create a new site node on this master site, and it has this database information. Now, using that DB info. We have the query API. And what the query API is, is that we'll go ahead and issue a query on all the sites that you defined as a site node on your master site. The query API handles database connections. So if you have five different site nodes and each one has five different connection streams, the query API will, as it goes through each site, it'll go ahead, open the connection, query that site, close that connection open the connection for the next site, query it, close it, and et cetera. And as it queries each site, it's storing the data. Um, basically, it's either, you can either store an array of results and objects from the database, or you can do some smart formatting to, to uh, store everything in one grand PHP array. And I'll show you how that works a little bit later. And lastly, with the query API, I mean, this is a pretty dangerous uh, tool. So don't do anything stupid. No drop statements, truncate, delete, even update insert, all of that. I mean, this is really primarily for select queries and for simple ones, too. Because I mean, if you put in some really crazy nested select statement on, on a large table that's unindexed, whatever, you're going to take down all the sites, just in one book. Now, building on top of the query API is data aggregation. And what this means is now that, you have, now that you have basically a database of all your site nodes, now that you have a way to go ahead and query each site with whatever you want, now we have very specific queries that we're going to want to issue. For example, a select count start from users. That's a pretty common you know, a piece of data you'd want to see, how many users are on each site. But data aggregation does a bit more than that as well. And I have in here three bullet points of management, cache, semaphore, and storage. So one way to, to make this scalable is, to, is we need to throttle the, the uh, number of queries that data aggregation will do at any given time. So you know, when it goes ahead and issues select count start from users on each site, it's going to store that information in a cache. Then it's going to create a semaphore on that data that maybe expires after five minutes or 10 minutes, or whatever. So if somebody else goes ahead and tries to issue this query, it'll just, instead of re-querying that data, it will just pull it from the cache instead. And storage management is actually, should be called permanent storage management. That's for data such as perhaps aggregation of over a period of time when, when you want to store how many new users registered on the site each day, you, you would store that information in the database table. So uh, you wouldn't risk losing that when the cache gets flushed. And data aggregation also handles the pron hook. So every time pron runs in the master site, it will go ahead and you know update the cache as needed based on what the sum of core value is. So there's a lot going on here. And it all builds on top of the query API and site node. And the last thing here is data output. So now that you have your site node, now that you have a way to query your site, now that you've written specific queries that you want to a data that you want to get and, and figure out how you want to store it, 
now you're finally ready to display your data to the user who needs to see it. So basically this is you know, sortable tables, perhaps you're using charts, maybe you're going to build a dashboard. Even SMRPC, if you write a service to get this data, you now have this whole back infrastructure you can just tap into and pull that data out. And um, I think now we're ready for a demo. So uh, this is going to be cool. I hope. Any questions so far? Which, what's the name of the module? Drupalets. So uh, the question was if, if we've I've done any work with the Drupalets module. Model, and um, the answer is uh, no, I've actually never heard of it. It's very Yeah, I'll take a look at it. I mean, one of the things that, uh, um, that was important to me when, when I did this was to write write a solution that was very specific to our environment first, and then after we kind of figure out what patterns would be good in a more general sense, we perhaps be able to go ahead and contribute that back to the community. So. No, no, I mean, I'd like to take a look at it though. So uh, please follow it up. Is it just D-R-U-P-L-E-P-L? Yeah, right. So uh, let's go ahead and begin this demo here, and I have, um, let me go ahead and do a little switchy switch here in the screens. So first I'm going to show you, uh, we'll get to this part a little later. First I'm going to show you some local sites I have set up here. I, I created a site here called Demo Master. So this is going to be our master su uh, site that's going to be getting data from Demo Site 1 and Demo Site 2. Uh, yeah. Repeat that the uh, um, the Drupalist module actually creates a sandbox site, whereas um, our site node module here is actually just basically creating a new node type that's storing some meta information about how to access the data of that site. And I'll actually go ahead and show that to you right now. Here, here is demo site one. A uh, bunch of dummy input uh, content users. I use the Devel module to do this. And the same thing with demo site two. So I just created these this morning. And here's the demo master site. And this is the admin content node page. So you can see, I already went ahead and created a, a site node for demo site one. If I click on this, you can view it. So here's the URL, database information, document through API key, filter key, on the end. And if you go to the edit page, you can see how this looks. So we have a for you guys here. So, um, so this is the name of the site. Database info, um, that's the DB name right there, the URL, and then you go ahead and save it. So I'd like to go ahead and just walk through the process of creating a, a node for a demo site too. And then we'll go ahead and query them using the interface here for the query API. So the name of our module is actually WBR site. So it is very uh, much a specific thing. But let's go ahead and create demo site two. I'll zoom in here and I'll just kind of struggle to move my mouse around. So uh, that's our name, description, can we plan? Let's scroll down. Let's go ahead and the host. I'm using Manfro on the Mac, so if you're familiar with that, it's no surprise that I Username and password is root root, so if you sum a computer, you can hack them with dev box, but it doesn't really matter. Site two, the name of that, and the URL here would be demo site two. Let's go ahead and save that now. Yeah, you can so so the thing about query API is that right now it's assuming that all the sites are on a MySQL server, and it's also assuming that it can access all of those servers or any of those MySQL servers. Um, well, one of the things that, that would be nice to do in the future with Query API is to remove that dependency on assuming MySQL, perhaps you know, maybe it could do Postgres or 
you know, insert, make a database server here. But, um, in the object site object is meant to be an abstraction. So, when we subclass it, in terms of doing a site object, as well as have subclass information for things like discussion for a website, it's way better. So here I, I just finished creating the node um, for demo site two. And if I go back now to say content management, content list, here we can yeah. see uh, the book down there. Right? And now let's do some cool stuff with this. Now let's go ahead and go to our query interface and uh, let's run some queries on these sites. So um, I'll zoom in here a bit, and let's just do a select count star, star, okay, from users. And come on, very zoom out a bit, and try to get that in there. So I mean, pretty quickly, you know, I did indeed create about 50 dummy users for demo site one, and, and 275 for demo site two, on top of a couple of default users I had already created. So I mean, that you know was pretty pretty fun. Let's go ahead and um, do a little more complex one. Let's say let's get the name and the mail from users where URID is greater than 45 and UID is less than 50. I know that there's an in-between clause, I can't remember it. But so this is going to basically return a couple fields, a couple rows, and you'll see how the smart formatting here in the PHP array is going to account for that. And already I have all that data, and I can see these are all dummy users, so it's, nobody here is at risk of identity theft. Um, <laughs> but um, you can see it returned nested array here, name, mail, etc. So that was pretty quick. But this is just a demo site. This is running on my local machine. You know, how the, the question, does this scale in production? And that's what I'm here to show you today. It absolutely does. It works like a charm. And um, and I'm going to do that right now. So on our, this is an actual live real-time data. Let me refresh this to make it even more real-time. I hope that we have wireless still. Great. Live real-time data. Online now, let's just go ahead and take a look at this. This is using the uh, data output part of the set. Mission Metallica, there are 602 users on right now. MyChemicalRomance.com, 205 users on. The Ben Sevenfold, the Surf One, Michael Mugwe, Josh Groban, Heart of Man. So right now, just using this API, we can very quickly see what our most popular Drupal sites are. Right now, today, total. Go ahead and sort that. Let's go ahead and sort it descending. So, um, <laughs> so uh, at nearly 200,000 users is missionofhealth.com. Following that is actuallymusic.com. <laughs> and you can see how popular Metallica has been over the last couple of months. I mean, the user base there just trumps all the other sites. And that site's only been up since May 27. So now, let's go ahead and query some of these sites in real time. This is the audience participation part. We're going to do a real query here, real time, live data from all of Warner Brothers Drupal sites. This is your once in a lifetime opportunity. Give me a query, preferably without a drop statement. <laughs> Anybody have one? No inserts or updates. I mean, the query API can do inserts and updates, but, but we're not going to. Actually, one thing about the query API I showed you in the demo, you know, it went ahead and created all the sites. If you want, if you just wanted to do one site, there's also a drop down here that you only do that one. But you know, something you want to select star, yeah, path. Can you just apply location, like a little count by zip code? I don't think all the sites are geocoded. That's the next one. Some of the sites have profile fields, and I don't know if it's completely standardized yet, but we could app try it. All right, how about email? Okay, sure. Let's 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 try that. Um, <laughs> let me use a like. So, um, so you're gonna have to help me out with the uh, so select count from users. 
where male is a Y and just female out front, right? These are the monikers. These aren't really the URLs. Ashley Music, for instance, are nearly 4,000 Gmail accounts. Disturbed has about 3,300. But that was uh, that was pretty quick. I mean, to query all that, uh, all those databases using the light statement for the wild card, it still basically was snap on. Metallica, 24,000 Gmail accounts. Uh, just about 200,000. Hmm? Age is you would be using um, <laughs> that some of the sites, not all the sites have the profile fields on them yet, and we can try it. Uh, I mean, it's a little more complex for query, but no, that's going to be too complex. Hmm? What, I mean, what, just anybody who's familiar with the Drupal, like with the default Drupal. Um, Database schema install. Just I mean whatever, whatever you can, whatever you want. Like maybe how many nodes? Oh, I don't know. That's a. I'm not sure. You know, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, users, user names that have the word metal. On Metallica. Why don't you do that? That's actually oh. fun. So I'll, I'll go ahead and um, I'll just swap mission Metallica here. And by the way, we're giving a more in-depth talk about Mission Metallica after lunch today. So, um, so go ahead and check that out. That's in the uh, room next door, I do believe. So let's go ahead. We're just going to create Mission Metallica. We're going to check for usernames that have the word metal in it. <laughs> Pretty cool. So the, uh, you can see that's uh, 6,741. And all? Oh, sure. Okay. And you can says we just go ahead and go back and create all the sites. Simple demographic profiling. Now we'll be able to see. So current event seven polls here has 51, and there's three team sites at 64. Blood and other. Okay, so yeah, definitely. Right. Then I guess retention site the surf has 361. What's another big middle site? Mastodon is 34, so that was very, very good, Pat. That was actually a pretty good way to really determine the musical genre of a band by, you know, the presence of a word in a username. <laughs> Serge Tankin, the use. So it's, yeah, everything that, what you'd expect, you know, all the sites that you'd expect to have the word metal in it, in, in usernames do. Static X has none, which is kind of, I guess, not a good sign for that band. Say our metal. Um, <laughs> so let me show you a couple more things here. I, I mentioned XML RPC earlier. I mean, right now we're, we're seeing data output through this query API. We also saw data output here in the table, and you know we're still in heavy development with a lot of this stuff. So we don't have charts yet. Actually, we do have charts. Let's see if I can. Um, oh, you know what? I'm going to have to. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to show that. Um, but let's go ahead and get to the uh, XMRPC. So we have the uh, services module on here with an XMRPC server. And a very common thing that I'm always interested in is to make sure that cron is running on all the sites. So we have a um, we have a function here in XMRPC called ask cron. And, uh, and what this does, this is using query API now to go ahead, query each site database, querying in the variable table for that cron last uh, variable, getting that data, formatting it in a way that we can read it like, like it appears in the admin status page, and it will return it as an SMPHP array. Let's go ahead and call that, done. So any, so here you can see that, here are the results. Cron had last run on these sites roughly about five minutes ago. 
we had fun running every 10 minutes on all of our sites, so I know that we're in good shape here. Um, this is XMLRPC. I mean, this is just an interface on the web page that any client, you know, with the credentials to get this information can get it. So we've actually built applications. We, we do have a Flex application that we run on our desktops that basically shows a bar graph for each site. And, it, and we know that Khan isn't running them on the sites and the bar graph is way up here and all the other ones are down there. So that's very useful visual information and, and that information is possible to see in, in real time because of query API and the site node and this whole, whole model of aggregating data and, and being able to store it, cache it, and output it. So that's it for the demo. If there's anything else um, that, if, if you want to see more of this, go ahead and find me afterwards, and I'd be happy to show you. And I'll also show you some of the code if, if you'd like as well to make this all possible. And. And if we're not doing it, we're halfway done. I'm going to let Ethan take over now. He's going to talk about some work he's been doing with the push model side of things. So let's go ahead and get back to our uh, talk. And uh, I'm going to drag this over. Drag. And then Ethan, go ahead and uh, take the floor. So we have, besides the need for polling data, we also have. 87 sites that are actively have things happening on them that um, as we've scaled up and doing a lot of sites and we've also scaled up and wanting more information about users, every user actually is starting to have more consequence in terms of needs to have things analyzed, needs to have that data analyzed, and also needs to have um, other hooks happen when a user does anything. So we had to also, we were having problems where we were adding on and on what happened when a user registered or what happened when a user logged in. Like, needed to geocode the data, we needed to log into the discussion board, to synchronize with the mailing list software, synchronize with the SMS software, all these needs that kept getting piled on and on as we registered like three quarters of a million users on our sites. So we had three needs primarily um, for the push model, which is sites, artist sites pushing data down to the central site. Data processing, data collection, and data analysis. Data processing is basically taking uh, data that a user is submitting and processing it to add more intelligence to it. The collection is to do historical data on a sample basis so it can track users logging in over time, profit over time, anything over time domain. And data analysis, which is the ability for us to take all 700,000 of these users and analyze them as one collective data set to do things like, well, it's kind of like a CRM function, but also the segment mailing list, to do targeted marketing, and also just to get better understanding about the users that we have in the sites. One of the changes in the record business is the record business used to just say, MySpace, you handle all the social networking. Uh, Apple, you handle all the commerce. And somebody else handle this, and we'll just put up billboards. And we've transitioned that model to, well, we'll handle the social networking, we'll handle the commerce, and we're not putting up billboards. We're trying to put up sites that are engaging with people. And uh, as a part of being engaging, it's now that we have all the data, how do you use it? And the biggest thing for us is that we, did, we couldn't have any latency. Um, as everybody knows, as you start adding in-band services that are dependent on external services to uh, actions from a user, you start getting imposed latency. Uh, and the way to get around this is to use queuing or to use other message, messaging type strategies. With every user action that we're doing now, like the user registering on the site, um, there's like 10 different actions that have to happen. And you couldn't do that in-band, even though we, we were primarily doing it in-band, and we've tried to transition to it being out of band. So our goal is zero latency, so the user can do an action, um, keep moving through actions, but still get that same intelligence to what they're doing. That would happen if we have in-band processes. So we decided to create a push model that complements the pull model, and this is kind of how we did the push model. Um, it's still in development. It's actually, I don't get time to develop during the week, because that's I don't have time, so I do it all the weekend and at night, but um, this is kind of how it looks. So at the top, you have the Drupal site, uh, which is any of our artist sites. And we have 87 of those, as we've said, and all of them have uh, user registration, login, and we always collect like gender, zip code, and birthday. Um, and about five, six of them have fan clubs. So we have Uber card installs that have full commerce enabled where you purchase a role. Um, and a couple of them have other types of features like that. So, 
in order to basically capture behavior over time of what users are doing and get that data process that they've now done, we, are, we back, took the backboard of the actions and triggers module and put it on Drupal 5. Um, as we do Drupal 6 installs, which we're going to start switching to, we'll just use it as a quick thing. And we attach to all the user actions, like user login, log out, delete, update, and create, um, sending that entire user object either through spread or XML or PC. So, an action's picked up, which is like a user registering, um, and that whole user object is then sent through spread or XML RPC to uh, an XMPP relayer. Spread, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it, anybody heard of spread? Spread Toolkit is a multicasting protocol framework. Um, it's used by Flickr, it's used by a couple other people. What it basically does is you have a daemon running on, on each client machine that you uh, connect to and send a packet of data to and it multicasts it out to every other machine that's within your spread cluster. Um, and it's a reliable message and it's an ordered message. But you can actually determine if you want to send a reliable or unreliable, so it's TCP or UDP. But it's all multicast. It's not a messaging queue, and it's not um, it's not like a Beanstalk D or S Sparrow or Starling, like one of those messaging queues or ActiveMQ or Apache MQ. It's more of a, a, a like a point-to-point -point messaging protocol. So it's used to, to dispatch events that, that are picked up uh, in a reliable manner between clusters and machines. And because it's using multicast, it's not subject to, to UDP and TCP traffic that um, like they're doing a direct socket connection is. The reason that we use spread, and I get into it later, is because of the, the, the spinning up of the process of the connection to the socket uh, and the shutdown of it is super fast versus doing direct XMPP. And it scales much better than XML RPC. What we've created in the middle, though, because XMPP is a good protocol, we have a Python daemon that is basically sits there and is an endpoint collecting data from spread, as well as having an XML RPC server, takes the packets of data that it gets, or the messages, like the user object, and relays it out through XMPP. So it actually sits on a Jabber server as a component, and it's a component because there's lower overhead, it doesn't maintain a roster on a Jabber server, um, it takes anything coming in through spread and just immediately relays it out to the Um The reason we did XMPP, maybe in this or two, is XMPP is, uh, is a multi-point perception kind of protocol. Spread is a one-to-one. -one. So whoever gets the message from spread first gets it and it's deleted from the queue. It's on a queuing system. It's a transport protocol. XMPP actually can be used to do queuing because it also does relaying out and it's a guaranteed messaging. Then it's picked up by a, a nice Python theme that we call async, I think is what I call it, but it's basically a cluster of two multi-threaded applications, the analyzers and responders. The analyzer takes the spread object, which is, say, the user, and it opens up the object, determines what the request type is, and it talks to that site that Sean showed, the digital detail, which is also our API endpoint. So, yeah, the, the user object gets submitted through XML RPC um, to ON Detail. ON Detail processes it, so it'll take the, for instance, the zip code and geocode it, and it'll determine if the user's registered before. It'll subscribe them to the mailing list, subscribe them to the SMS list, register their account on the discussion board, and then return the fully processed object to the, to the responder, which then posts it back through XML RPC to the client site, which is why we store the API key in the site. This is all multi-threaded, so there's actually 20 threads of analyzers sitting there and 40 threads of responders. So we can handle 20 simultaneous user objects getting processed at once. And once the data's back, it just keeps shoving it in the responder queue and it multi-threads calling all the different sites back. Um, I've tested this with 1,000 requests per minute, and it worked okay, and a couple hundred requests per second, and it was working fine. Um, because of Python's coolness, um, with queuing objects. It passes all messages between them using synchronized uh, queue objects. Um, and that's kind of that. I don't know if anybody have any questions on that. That's like a super technical overview. But um, so one thing that I can just clarify um, so, so this is using XMR PC. Um, and if you notice that during when I was talking, each site had an API key field in there. So that and you can just brought that point up. That's why the site node is really important because we can store additional information such as the API key that just make use of the XML RPC server. 
said is he, it, that works in his fish model as well. So, it, so um, even though these are two different models we're talking about, there are a lot of interdependencies between them as far as they both, you know, they both have the same master site that they're working with and they both kind of pull some of their information from the same place. The whole reason we did this architecture is I can take any of these systems out at any level and it will still keep functioning. Before the message is sent through spread, it buffers it with a GUID, and it won't clear the buffer until the callback is executed. So it will send a user object, and it can take 10 minutes for it to get processed, or whatever it's going to take. It won't clear it from the buffer until it gets the callback with the processed object. And that applies to anything we send through this, which includes, like, if I want to geocode a tour date, and I have a full address, and I need to get the longitude and latitude to do radius searches, it will do that. If I need to encode an image, if I need to encode a video, if I need to process a fulfillment to a merch warehouse, which is what we also use this for, all of those happen out of band, but they're buffered on each site. So if the whole system goes down, all those requests will just get queued up. When it comes back up, we just create the queue, and it all gets sent back again, and then it'll get cleared. Yeah. So from, from a high level, the user logs on to one of your Drupal sites. Drupal will take that user data and use it to register it on all your other servers? No, we're not using it to do cumulative registration. We're using it to uh, consolidate registrations on the, the site on the digital detail site. So we'll be able to pull up a user, like my name, and I'll see every site we've regist I've registered for, how much I've spent on every site, how long I've spent on every site. Um, and we're keying that information by first email address. And then as we get more data, we use it to specify the user even more. So we'll have more ways of finding them, like a pattern within their username, um, so that we can keep that information clear. This system would also work, though, for doing cross-site syndication which is a need for us, for some people, where if you post a new news item, it would go down to here, and then it can get, you can set a rule set for, oh, this will get reposted to these three sites. Um, so it could be used also as a content router. It's more of a, we try to create a loose framework that, that is redundant and reliable. Um, and also, you know, because when you register for a site, you can just keep doing things, and then suddenly, like maybe 30 seconds later, your user object is geocoded. But you don't even know if it happened, it just kind of happened. So some reasons why we did things this way. Why spread? Spread's kind of like not a known protocol. It's used a lot uh, in very large scale applications. The reason why I like it, it's a transport protocol and not a queue. So it's extremely lightweight. It's not written in Ruby, it's written in C++. It's a compiled application. It's version 4.0, it's not in beta. It's used by IBM and their clustering systems. So it's a super, maintain the kind of under the radar, not web 2.0 trendy tool, which I kind of like. Um, the people module for PHP is a bit immature, which is why we put more redundancy in, which is why <laughs> spread goes down. I post things through XML RPC instead, the same way. Um, there's no session set up. XMPP, if you connect from PHP to XMPP, which there's been a lot of talk about the Java protocol is replacing REST. Um, people have realized that there's spin up because it doesn't do anything until it gets a response back saying the session was created. So we had, we did a bunch of tests between XML RPC from PHP to XML RPC, PHP to XMPP, PHP to spread, and spread came out the winner on each case. Um, it, by magnitude, XMPP was an over a second spin up time per request um, to send a request. The spread was 0 0.002 milliseconds. Uh, and XML RPC was 0 0.003, but XML RPC crapped out after a thousand connections per second. And spread was just a raw packet stream, it doesn't care. Um, but we provide the alternative just in case, and also for lower traffic sites that if we don't want to flood the spread. Um, and then why the XMPP relay? Since spread's a transport protocol, it's not, it's whatever, whoever gets the request first gets it. So the daemon sits on a blocking method waiting for requests to come in. And, but if somebody else gets that request, like because I spun up another process, uh, it's going to get it instead of that one. And so we lose the packet. XMPP is now, we use it as a relay because if it sends it out, I can have 50 clients connected that are all getting the same thing. So we can have one thing doing one thing and one doing another. Um, and as long as you're persistent, there's no latency on that. Um, it's also federated because I can create multiple listeners. And then why Python? Um, simplest answer is this, <laughs> just the XKCD comic. Python was just easy. Um, I know Java better than Python, but Python's more fun. Uh, and also Python has 
exceedingly good multi-threading and synchronization without worrying about some of the blocks like in Java. You just can kind of logically think about how you want to do multi-threading and use synchronized objects to communicate between threads, and it works perfectly. Um, and then actions. So on the Drupal side of thing, we're creating actions that send to spread uh, for things that involve data exchange uh, and data that needs to get processed, login, update, delete, geocoding of data. So if we put any data in with the zip code instead of doing geo names in time, which is what the location module does, uh, which doesn't scale at all, um, we're doing it out of band. We, we started using locations where if you submitted the data, it would get geocoded or geocoded and run. And it was just compulsory. If you get a registration a second, like we are getting in some cases, it doesn't scale. Uh, and then also video and photo encoding, which is what Flickr uses spread for, um, just how they encode their video or photos. And then the API. So underneath everything, you saw there was this API at WBR.com. The API um, we're using is you know, basically like simple object abstraction. Instead of having dependencies of the site to a specific API, like GeoNames and to Lyris, which is our mailing list software, or Vision Discussion Board, we created an abstraction layer that sits on top of all those and simplifies the API transactions um, and also abstracts them. So instead of calling it GeoNames as the endpoint, it's geocoding. So I can swap in other services without changing any of the, uh, the top line code. It there. We can actually show a demo of that um, after this if, if we have time uh, as well. It goes back to the same uh, services interface that I showed the last run. Yep. Uh, all those services are there. So it also acts as a means for me to simplify things. Like our mailing list software has 80 methods exposed through SOAP, um, but we only needed three of them. And so we just simplified it by we'll do four, four SOAP calls for one XML RPC call to subscribe a user, update their segmentation of geographic data and then update a couple other things. And to get tracking data on a mailing list, instead of having to get, like, first select the, the last blast name, then find the list ID, and then find this, I just do it all on one XML RPC request. And we also have this sitting on top of legacy systems that don't speak APIs. Like our uh, fulfillment warehouses does things through what's called EDI, which is a, a data format that's all through FTP. Um, to send fulfillment requests into the warehouse to get the response back saying and the merch item was sent and all that good stuff. So we created an API on top of that that's easier for us and other partners to implement. So the ultimate goal of what we're doing with both the push and the pull model is to create one site that has the user of record, uh, which means that we have one user of record that applies to not only the sites, but also all the external services that have user records as well. As you grow a, a web infrastructure, you start to having uh, a lot of different systems that have a lot of different records for each user. Our mailing list software has records for each user, our discussion board, our SMS software, um, and then you keep adding to that, and we'll add services as we do. Um, we wanted one user of record that we can use as the master synchronization. So if I need to synchronize mailing lists and discussion board and SMS and the site, I know I have one record to query for that. Um, and then on Sean's side is the site of record. So we have one site of record entry for each site, depend, even if, as we grow and have more and more servers and more versions of websites. And then the API abstraction layer, which is to simplify and interfacing with external APIs, including systems that don't have APIs and are super old, older than me kind of systems, like AS400s, so, which is what the fulfillment warehouse is running on. Um, and then all of this operating in like a Grand Central Station method that this, this one site is what routes all the API requests, it does all the processing of data, so it kind of dumps down the sites to a certain extent, but we have one central place that's smart, which is we grow from 87 sites to um, 1,000 maybe, we'll scale. In the future, one, we, need, we would like to open source a lot of this because it make it more generalized. Right now it's really specific. Um, I would like to get it open source so that other people can help us with it. Um, in order, the reason for that is we need to get this to scale to a thousand sites. In order to do that and be agnostic to all these different types of engines, we need other people's help. Um, and uh, I guess we can open for questions. Yeah. Um, what are the thoughts on scaling hardware for a thousand sites? 
We've gotten pretty good at scaling Drupal in the past year. So right now we run 87 sites, including you saw Metallica, which will have on average 1,500 to 2,000 people on, on it at any given point. Um, with all the, like, cumulatively we can have maybe 6,000 people on sites at any given point. And we've done that on a cluster of three web servers uh, with three database servers using some kind of brain replication. We're moving to a new data center where we're going to be a little bit smarter on our scalability for more redundancy um, because we're starting to actively market the sites, which hopefully gets the simultaneous user counts up. Um, the, the key about scaling Drupal, uh, and we talk about it in the Metallica talk a bit too, is one, use caching, uh, two, memcache if you can, and three, just being smart with what you architect. Um, the biggest problems with scaling Drupal, a thousand sites on, on a and infrastructure is Drupal has a tendency to make really bad queries, especially if you make really bad decisions of views and content types. So you have to be, we've had to be very deliberate on how we architect websites in order to um, make sure that we don't have these problems. And in fact, one of the things that you know Sean and I both do is we run, I have a slow query log in my top running, uh, my leftmost monitor all day. Um, and if I, we have it patched so that my top will turn red if there's a lock, or deadlocking problems. So it's also a lot of active diligence and debugging and watching your slow query logs and watching for, for lock contingency or contentions. Um, being very smart on how you choose InnoDB versus MISO. Um, and also what we're talking about here, which is taking processes out of hand where you can. Um, because as you start building websites, you're like, oh, I want geocoding, oh, I want this, I want this. Each of those adds in-band processes on every load, which is the consequence of a hook-based architecture. So you have to start being smart with what data you collect and where you collect it. Starting for us is making the sites dumber and making the central engine smarter. Because I can federate the central engine a lot easier than I can federate a thousand websites. So, yeah. I run the tech department, so I have all the fun politics and meetings and phone calls that have to legal agreements and all the good stuff that involves being like a CTO or a company. Yeah. Oh, well, what I do on the like, Yeah. He, the question was, since I only program a week, what I do during the week. Um, I keep busy, but it, I'm mostly on the phone and in and, and meetings. And I'm well, you know, let me just uh, <laughs> answer that one briefly. I mean, you know, during the work day, like our, our normal hours of operations are about 10 to 7 on like Friday. And, you know, it's basically, I mean, it's really no different than any other business or company. There's always fire drills that will pop up. You know, we might be launching sites, we might have meetings, or whatever. And, and everybody in here, as soon as the developer, since this is a developer's trap, you would all know that to really get any good developer work done, you just really need to allow yourself a good chunk of time, four hours, to sit down and get through stuff. And, and that's like almost impossible to do during work hours because there's always things going on, things that come up. So, so I think that's what Ethan really meant by like, you know, like being able to design our architect, you know, the, when it's you work with the spreadsheet, we'll get all that stuff. We, there's just no time during the work day to, to really do that. So that's it's more of a night hobby, weekend hobby, but that but it is work related. And once we get to a point where we can apply it to, to um, operations that work, then we do so. And, 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 I, and I'm right there with them. I mean, all the modules that I built were done on the weekend. <laughs> In the back. Yeah, what was it about Drupal that you gravitated towards Drupal as opposed to any other system or something of this scale? Uh, the question was, what was it about Drupal that wanted us to use it? Um, I've used Drupal since two, version two, um, when I was in grad school and college. Um, and when we, when I got to Warner Brothers, we had this really, really crappy legacy. Um, CMS, and there's really no organization for in terms of the technology and no scale. Um, we looked at a bunch of CMSs, really two, but we decided on Drupal because the development community was very robust. It wasn't being split like the other people, um, and it had a Joomla, and it had a lot of. Um, I like because it was it, it fit into my pyramid down methodology of development, which is least specific to most specific. And where Joomla seemed very siloed, as very specific, very specific, very specific, and then kind of bolted together. So I really liked it. You got a lot less out of the box, but you got a lot more if you quit working to it. Um, we 
we've been active in the development community since we had adopted it. We've tried to kind of put back a lot, and now I think there's three other record labels that are using Drupal, so I figure we, we set a trend, maybe. And, and also, I think the point, we, we started using Drupal about two years ago, and, and it, I mean, I might be wrong, but I don't think it was as popular then as it was now, and, um, and it definitely wasn't as geared, you know, at, from a marketing point of view, um, like, like Joomla is. So uh, Drupal is very developer-centric, and, and we're our partners, so I have computer science degree. So I know how to program, I know my PhD works well, and I love Drupal because I had documentation and it had the, the base architecture and user modules and everything. So, so it just made more sense from that point of view as well. Um, there was a question over here. Yeah, the general comment we guys are doing is awesome, and I, I consider it definitely the forefront of uh, um, high volume scale systems level Drupal work. And I have two questions. One is, where is Drupal getting in the way? And what are the hard things uh, that you guys are running into where Drupal is just not doing what we need it to do, or it's doing it slightly differently than what you want to do? And my second question is pretty specific and a little bit outside of what you guys are talking about. But the big question for me, you guys are managing 100 sites, soon to be 1,000 sites. How do you handle updates and code changes to clean all Yeah. Okay. So the first question is prefaced with we're awesome. Two, the question was, um, why are, where is Drupal getting in the way? I say the biggest struggle we have with Drupal is that, that we're dependent on so many different people that are doing like Uber Cards here, we, people that are working on the services module, people that are working on all these pieces that are for us, and they're all at various levels of maturity. And so we always have, you always have to go to kind of the lowest common denominator level of maturity for any given product to set your baseline. So that, as we try to progress to Drupal 6 and things like that, sometimes it's a case of we're too far ahead, or sometimes we're not as far ahead as we need to be. Um, and also, because of the nature of open source, like services module is revising how the API key works, which is really good to make it more secure, but we've already built for the one branch of the API key methodology, now we have to kind of rebuild. So I think that the challenge is, uh, is not specific to a Drupal thing, it's just doing with open source. Uh, the, the reason big companies like, like Warner Music Group, our parent company, buy enterprise software is because they don't have to think too much. And the reason that we like open source software is it requires us to think a lot. And also the act of thinking a lot makes our cost about a hundredth of what the cost of not thinking is. So. I think that what Drupal's provided to us is that you know the entire project has cost as much as like a exploration consulting exercise with the Deloitte, um, which is what people that don't like me would, would do. So I think that it's given us more than it's cost. It just causes us to have to think a little bit more. Causes the um, a little bit more education in the company in terms of if we run up against a roadblock, you know, the traditional model in an enterprise software is throw more money at it, and for us it's no less actually like think about it a little bit more, but it also enables us to turn a lot more responsibly to requests. Um, we'll talk about that with the Metallica one, not to give a trailer to our afternoon talk, but. And then the second part, Sean. So, okay, the second question was, um, how do we manage code updates, site updates, et cetera, with 87 sites? And that's a great question, and um, and I should cut this up by saying that we have how many people do we have in this tech department? Like one, two, four people. You're looking at two of them here, and the other, the third one, uh, Sarah, it should be coming to later today for the talk talk, and we have one more. We all wear many different hats throughout the day. This kind of goes back to the other question, why don't we do any development at work? Because we're wearing so many hats and there are so many projects going on simultaneously and so many little things, such as updates to this side A, side B. So because there are only four of us, we work with a lot of external um, vendors. Some of them are in this room here, actually. And most of the site dev work is done by these external developers. And one of my responsibilities when I came aboard a couple years ago was to create an environment for these developers to work on. And it created an infrastructure to, to basically have a dev site and push it live. So that infrastructure is, for the code, it's subversion. Essentially, it's what we use to, to version all the code. 
And any time that there's a small CSS change or maybe a templating change, the developer might work on it. We actually have somebody in-house who make those changes too now. Um, they'll go ahead and commit it to the repository. They'll update the dev site, make sure everything looks okay. If it looks good, the process right now literally is they'll IM me on AIM or Skype or email and say, SVN up, Ashley music. And I'll log into the terminal and I'll literally type SVN up and I'll do, you know, update the code. Of course, you know, I use my discretion. I'll go ahead and do a status check to make sure in fact, there won't be any conflicts or nothing's going to break. And this is for really minor updates. And I'm not the only one who can do updates. Obviously, Ethan can too. Uh, Sarah can is on here as well. But, but really, that burden mostly falls on me. That's the hat I wear uh, uh, for that. Those are for minor updates. We also have to deal with major updates. Major updates involve when you have a site in production, you take the snapshot of that site, meaning that you just do a database dump. You take the existing code, maybe the existing uploaded, uploaded files, replicate that on a dev server somewhere, and now begin redeveloping the hell out of it. All while the production site is still out there collecting new user data. So what happens when, when it comes time to push these changes live, you have to do synchronization of data. You have to merge the data. You have to merge all that new data that was accumulated on the production site from the time you took the snapshot so the time you want to launch, scrunch that into the new dev site somehow, then push that dev site live. That is a very complicated process, but we do it. And I've broken that down into two steps. And each step take about, takes about two to three hours of my time. It's really a bitch. Um, <laughs> the first step is on the dev site, any sequence ID, I will shift up by a certain delta. So to give you an example, if I take a snapshot of a production site that has five nodes on it, and then we do some dev work on it. During the time that we've done dev work, the production site accumulated three more nodes. This is really trivial. And, um, and, and on the dev work, we put in two no new nodes, right? So now on the production site, you have node ID 6 is content A. and the dev site, you have node ID 6 is content B. But we have to merge that data. So and, and you can't just do a simple, you know, select and insert because you're going to have a conflict with those node IDs. So, so I have a script, basically, that will go ahead and shift all instances of each node that needs to be shifted up by a certain amount of delta to merge the, the new production data in. Um, there are other solutions. This is, this is like a, this is an issue now. I should mention that it's not inherent to Drupal. It's basically inherent inherent to any. Uh, CMS or any system that actually doesn't take this into account uh, um, in its core. So um, there have been some solutions such as you should have sequence IDs use even numbered uh, IDs on production and odd numbered IDs on dev so that it's much easier to merge them. Yeah. We don't have that set up yet, but that is something that we might consider in the future. Drupal 6, and actually in Drupal 6, the sequences table is no more, so it makes it a little easier. Part of, part of the difficulty with Drupal 5 is that it relies on the sequences table and not the inherent auto increment uh, function of MySQL or insert database type here. So, um, so essentially, major, major site updates are a very uh, complicated process, and that's done in house, but a lot of the site, like, like really simple site updates and the development work is done out of house. And then it's basically up to us to provide that environment, provide the means for the developers to go ahead, um, update the development sites, and let us know when the changes are ready to go live. 